Auto Web. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Before we get started, I got a public service announcement. So I guess it's really a listener service announcement. So last week, you all know that I invited folks to text me about this new software we got going on, the M3, right? So I said, hey, text me M3. But some of y'all have been MIA. We've sent you emails. We're following up. We're looking to put together this demo, and you're not responding. So don't make me say no names. Here's what I'm going to do, because somebody did remind me I need to put a, a, a time limit on this thing. So I'm going to give folks folks until let's just say November 16th that'll be the day after the next podcast drops uh, you can text me the letters M3 if you want to get a demo of our brand new software the money mind map if y'all don't have my number here it is 267-551-6279 going to send me the letters M3 outside of that I don't know what to tell you anyway Back to our regularly scheduled program, AutoWeb. Welcome to the Millionaire Car Salesman Podcast, the number one resource for automotive sales professionals, managers, and owners to learn how to make money, accumulate wealth, and to all out ball out in the auto industry. And now your hosts, Sean V. Bradley and L.A. Williams. One, two, three, four, AutoWeb. Hey everybody, this is Sean B. Bradley, president of Dealer Synergy, wow, and the creator of the Millionaire Car Salesman uh, Facebook group and the Millionaire Car Salesman podcast. And yo, I've got a treat for you today. I've got McKenna Genki, okay? She works at Timber Ford in Hayward, Wisconsin, and uh, she's a rising star in the industry. She just recently got promoted to sales manager. She just got married. Shit, you better play the lottery or something because you're on fire right now, girl. So how are you doing? Doing good. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Hell yeah, absolutely. First of all, much respect. You're only 25 years old. How long have you been in the automotive industry for? It'll be two years in February. Holy smokes. Okay. Only 25 years old, two years in, and you just made it as a sales manager. Um, so like, talk to us, what did you do before, before selling cars? I did. I graduated with a degree in HR and then did that for a little bit out of college. Didn't love it. Then COVID hit. So I was out, um, did mail for a little bit after that, after moving back to my hometown and then got this opportunity and here we are. Okay, so you were selling cars two years ago. So you got a college degree in HR, then you got into the automotive industry, and uh, you were crushing on the floor. Okay, so tell us what you were doing as a car salesperson, at, like for to generate opportunity in business. Well, the first thing that I really did was listen to my manager and owner. <laughs> I have a really good owner and manager here, and really good team who pushed me. Uh, they were the ones who told me to basically create my own brand, and I just took that and ran with it. So I do key tosses to all my sold customers that will allow me to. And then also doing, I bring myself as- Wait, stop, 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 stop. Okay, I know what it is, but there's people listening on the podcast, what the hell is a key toss? So what does yeah. that mean? So yeah, so I take a video of them, like of myself, like looking at them, and then I toss the key back and they have to catch it. So it's <laughs> kind of like a fun, and then I put music on it and make it fun. All right. So you do key tosses with your people. And what do you have? A, like my daughter, she was T got your keys. Did you have like a little name or, or what was the brand? Yeah. McKenna made it happen. McKenna, McKenna made it happen. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. So your brand within the dealership is McKenna made it happen. Okay. Mm -hmm. So how do you work that in? Is it in the graphics? Is it in a, do you say it? Talk to us. Yeah. I've got a pretty cool sign. It has the hashtag McKenna made it happen. On it. They hold it in the videos and then I also throw that in on all of like social media posts, things like that. You have the sign um, by you now or no? Um, I don't, but I can get it really quick. No, no, no. It's okay. We're <laughs> in the middle of the live stream. It's okay. So you have a sign that goes through it. All right, good. So um, what's the most amount of cars you sold in a month? 30. Oh my gosh. So you broke 30 cars. Granted, I was the only salesperson on the okay. floor, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, but you sold 30 cars by yourself. So now out of those 30... Were they all brought in by you or were they from fresh ups, internet ups, phone ups? Where'd you get your 30 ups from, your 30 deals from? I mean, a pretty good mixture. Um, a lot of it, we're a smaller town, so we have a lot of repeat customers. I built a lot of referrals. Um, all of like my manager, all his customers too, they come in. I help them out as well because he doesn't really take those anymore. So a lot of it was just people knowing my name, coming in, social, and 
ups on the lot, I would guess as well. All right. So here, there's eight ways that a car salesperson could sell cars. You've got walk-in spots, you've got B-backs, you've got internet ups, you've got phone ups, you've got prior customers slash orphan owners, you got service conversions, you got referrals, and then you got the lost auto prospecting. So let's just take some of these off. Okay. So walk-in ups, I'm sure that you got fresh ups on the lot in the showroom. Okay. I'm sure there's some people that have called as a phone up. There might be some internet, the internet leads. Uh, let's put all that stuff to the side. Let's talk about be backs. Okay. What did you have a good be back strategy? Cause I find that most salespeople suck at doing be backs. Like they'll follow up with somebody that comes in after like maybe a couple of days or a week, and then, then they just let them die. What is your personal belief on be backs? Meaning prospects, wherever they came from, they came in and they were not spotted that first time that you had them. How do you handle them? What's your be back follow-up protocol? My follow-up protocol would be, I do a phone call the next day and then immediately send them a text as they leave the dealership. That seems to be huge because then they're thinking of me immediately again. And then I try to do, not try, I do. I get everything that I could possibly can from them before they even come into the building. So whether that's credit app information, um, what they're looking for, things like that, so that it makes it a less stressful experience when they come in. They don't just sit around and wait. Now, not, it kind of eliminates that wasted time that they're just sitting around. Um, that's the, I think that's how I got them, people back, is then do that, then they come back in. I don't know if I, well, I have a lot of be backs, I guess. <laughs> right. So, but do, do you feel that you were, that, that you had people come back in that, did, that weren't spotted to buy cars from you again? How long do you think it, it you're, in your just guesstimation, just, just guess, how, how long is it usually? Is it one week? Is it two weeks? Is it three weeks? Is it 30 days? When do you find that sweet spot when you're able to get people to come back in? I'd say within a week. A week. Okay, good. So you're pretty, you're, you're pretty relentless with it. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I don't do that by constantly coming at them. I think I just do it by creating value when they're actually here and then they just need a moment to think about it and they come back. Um, and they know, I mean, I build a lot of myself in it. Like I kind of tell them too, like you're getting me on top of this vehicle too, which most people won't go and do above and beyond. Like I will that yeah. kind of a thing. All right. So we talked about the be backs. You mentioned referrals. Okay. You get a lot of referrals coming through for you. A lot of people asking for McKenna, McKenna, McKenna. Yeah. Okay. How do you do that? So what is your process to generate referrals? Because before you go, let me kind of explain. In my opinion, as a national trainer, there's two different ways to do this. One is reactively and one is proactively. Let me explain the difference. Reactively is if you spot a car, you know, all you're doing is you're not just you, but in general, salespeople could just ask the person that you just sold them a car. Hey, if you know anybody that's in the market, you know, let me know. And either I'm going to give them a great experience I gave you or that. And if you do, I'm going to give you a bird dog or referral fee. But to me, just asking those people is, is just a little tiny piece of it versus creating referral agents all over the, the town, the city, or what have you. So I'm really curious, what was your referral generating strategy? How did you generate referrals? So it started out as the first option that you said. So me just telling people as they leave and letting them know, like, please send people my way. Um, and then it turned more into, I, these people became my friends. Like they are referring people left and right to me. And we are, we are in a state where we can't do the bird dog and stuff like that. So um, mine is more just getting them to like me. And then they send people my way, I guess. And I think that I create a good experience so that then they want their friends and family to go through those same fun experiences as well. Cause most people have had bad experiences at dealerships. No, then, then, let me just stop right there because so for some of our listeners that, that you might not know this, but there's certain states apparently like Wisconsin, that it is illegal to pay a referral fee or bird dog fee. Now, again, that's not bad because Ali Retta, the guy that broke the Guinness Book of World Records, he never pays for a referral, you know, which is crazy because for me, like I'm of the mindset, bribe them, bribe them, bribe them, give them as much money as you can. The more money you can put out there. Hell, if the dealership gives you a $200 bird dog, like when my daughter was working, I would tell my daughter to on top of the $200 you get from the dealership, dig in your own personal pocket, whether it's 50 or hundred bucks, especially if you're making these ridiculous grosses, the idea is to just string them out, get them cracked out, get them turned out on all this money. But what I'm finding is that, you know, you don't necessarily have to do that. So 
If that's the case, break this down. Like you are a sales manager right now. Congratulations, by the way. So pretend you're talking to me as one of your salespeople, McKenna, but you're really talking to tens of thousands of people now, right? So what I want you to do is, is train me. Like you're, you're, you're a sales manager and here, I'm going to go boss. My God, McKenna, like, I'm so glad to be on your team and you're my sales manager. It's inspiring that you actually sold 30 cars. Cause I was just told in, in this video from, from Ford manufacturer, the average car salesman only sells 10 cars or less and you tripled it. I want to be like you. I want to be like you, McKenna. Um, how did you do it? McKenna says referrals. Okay. Well, teach me. When do I ask referrals? How do I ask referrals? What do I say specifically? Forrest Gump simple. Go. Oh gosh, Forrest Gump, simple. Okay, so I would say, first of all, you want them to like you, right? Like, you're not going to buy, Sean, you're not going to buy from somebody who doesn't like you or you don't like them, right? Right. Essentially not going to. So you have to create that relationship with them, whether that's I mean, knowing their kids' names or knowing what kind of vehicle they had previously and why they like those that, that vehicle and what they want to get into next. So creating the referral goes deeper into you're their friend now. So I know you, like the, common saying is friend in the car business, but I want to be your friend all the time. So that kind of, you have to have skin in the game too. So you have to ask for the referral. You have to say, you know, but a lot of times you want to create that relationship that you don't necessarily have to flat out ask them for a referral. They're just going to send people your way. And you're going to do that by get, being honest with them, being open with them. I think people respond very well to that when you're being blunt and honest with them. And then they don't think that you're hiding things like a typical car dealer would. Um, and then, oh gosh, I don't, I don't know what the right word would be. So if I'm understanding what you're saying, like, especially when you're in a situation that you're not legally allowed to pay a bird dog, if you want a referral, you've got to be worthy of the referral. What I heard yeah. you say is that if, if, you're, if your prospect or your client doesn't like you, is not having fun with you, um, the, it's very rare that they're going to refer people to you, especially if there's no financial incentive. So the biggest nugget I just got from what you said, McKenna, is that what we have to do is give people a great experience, be very open, very honest, very fun, but we've got to give them an incredible experience that's worthy enough for them to refer us. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Exactly. You have to be better than the person that isn't going to go above and beyond. For example, I mean, I've paid for things for customers out of my pocket before. I mean, I've paid for a fix on a vehicle because we, the store just won't do it. I've done that. So I've got skin in the game with my customers. I am dedicated to them. I put money into them. I put time into them. I put, I want to get as much out of them as they, as I'm giving them, if that makes sense. Um, no, so that makes a lot of sense. So you're not just coming to work and taking the up and going through the motions. You are mentally, emotionally, economically tied to this prospect. So you want them to be happy, successful, and for them to achieve whatever objective it is, whether it's a new car, whether it's a special price or getting something fixed, you're trying to do that. Okay, this is good information. So let's say we've done that, McKenna. Let's just say based on like, if I'm your, your student, if I'm your salesperson and you're training me and I got it, okay. I got to be really good. I've got to be professional. I got to go above and beyond. And hell, if I've got to put skin in the game myself, whether it's time or it's money or whatever, I've got to do that. Let's say checkbox, 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 checkbox. I've done all that. What then? How do I get the referrals? What do I say? What are the magic words to get people to refer to me? Because I hear you. Some people are going to naturally, like, oh my God, Sean is the best. Oh my God, McKenna is the best. You got to I get that. But I don't want to rely on hope. Hope is not a strategy. Just like GoFundMe is not insurance. Hope is not a strategy. I don't want to just hope that I did such a good job that they're going to magically send me referrals. I want to be proactive. I want to ask for referrals. So do you have a strategy of when you ask for referrals? Who do you ask for referrals? How do you ask for referrals? I always, as we're leaving, as we do the key toss, I say congratulations one more time and they're about to leave. And I just say, hey, anybody that you can send my way, I would greatly appreciate it. And I'll take care of them as much as I've taken care of you. And then I kind of leave it at that. I don't push it too intensely. And then when they're in for service for the first oil change, I'm constantly going through the service schedule, seeing if any of my customers are going to be here that day. And then I'm going to check in with them when they're here. So that keeps me at the front of their mind as well. 
or if they're not doing their service work here, I will call them. Stop, you know, stop, stop. I want to stay on service. This was a good transition. Let me just educate our listeners. A service customer is seven times as likely to purchase a vehicle from where they service their car from. I'm going to repeat that. A service customer is seven times as likely to purchase a vehicle from where they service their car from. Unfortunately, too many salespeople don't respect the service drive. They don't take advantage of you know of their prospects that are coming through so i thought that was brilliant so mckenna can you repeat that again like what what do you do what's your crm that you use by the way on um, e-leads okay so you're on e-leads so talk to us exactly how do you pay attention where do you pay attention to your customers coming into service and the first oil change go through that whole concept because again pretend like you're the sales manager that you are and you're training me as a new salesperson on how to engage my prospects so go so for our store in particular, we clock in on the service um, computers. So immediately when you clock in, the service schedule is up already on that computer. You can also go into CRM at your own desk if you have access to that and look at the service for the appointments as well. But that's where I would have my sales staff go into the computer as they are clocking in for the day. It's the very first thing they're going to do. They're going to look at that service schedule and they are going to immediately see if any of their customers are in there. And then they can also see if maybe there's some prospects that they've been working with as well already that are open, hot customers that they're going to be here today. Oh, shoot. That's a reminder to them too. Hey, let me go in and start working with them as well. Or I'll get some stuff and prep before they're going to be here. All right. So pretty much what a salesperson needs to be able to do is like whether you're an e-leads or Vince Solutions, what have you, the CRM usually acknowledges your customers that are coming in to service. Super pro tip number one is don't be a douche and not go say hello to your people. See, a lot of times salespeople, they do is like, oh, there's no point in me wasting my time. I already sold them a car. They're in there for the oil change. I can't sell them another car. I can't do that. But what I heard you say a freaking 25 years old, brand new sales manager has only been selling cars for two years who already broke 30 cars. Like you're freaking amazing. And one of your amazing tips is, hey, every time I, my customers are coming in, even if it's for all change, I'm going over there for like a PR, a public relation conversation. So talk to us. What are some of the things? Let's just say that I was in for my oil change. What would you say to me if I'm over there? Like, because here's what I find. And McKenna, as a sales manager, you're going to find this. As a sales manager, you're going to say, work the service drive. Hey, work the service drive, work the service drive. Hey, you have, you've got salespeople that are, uh, that are brand new. You're going to try to mold them and say, look, some people might not see value in going in for somebody's oil change, but it is. What you've got to do is give them the skills. Because if you just say, work the service drive or go say hello to somebody who's got a first oil change, they, even if they go over there, they might feel awkward or not what to not know what to say or and not do it. So talk to me. What should I say or what would you say if it was me? So I'm getting my oil change, okay? And you come in there. What do you say to me? I will immediately see you, you know, pop in here. You come in for your oil change and you'll walk through the showroom. You'll go to sit down. And I'll, I'll pop, usually pop over there. If I see you immediately, I'll be like, oh, hi, how is it going? Like, hey, guys. <laughs> and then if I don't see you right away, I'll kind of make a joke out of it as, oh, you snuck in on me again. Like, you know, and then I'll go over there and just see how things are going. And I mean, honestly, probably about 98% of the time, they're going to say something that they want different or something that they like or or something like that. And sometimes it'll be issues that they'll have like, oh, service didn't do this. Well, then I'm going to immediately go back there and I'll take care of it myself. So for an example, like if they haven't gotten their tunnel cover on properly, I'll go on back there and I'll put the tunnel cover on myself if it's not right. So I will, I'm creating value in that aspect too, because I'm just saying hi to them, just saying hi, touch and base. And then that'll bring up something that maybe they need help with. And then I'll take care of it. So there, oh, I just fixed another problem for them on top of them needing a new vehicle. So you're staying at the forefront. You're just always staying at the forefront of their mind. McKenna, this is really strong. This is coming from Cody Carter, from Chrissy Burton, from Ali Retta, from all these great people. Uh, they say that they want to control the entire customer experience. Obviously, you're not the service writer, you're not the you're not the technician, you're not the parts counter person, but you are like air traffic control. So I love that. You want to basically qualify your prospect, make sure whatever reason they're in service, that experience is going well. If there's something that they that they're missing or they need, you definitely are right on track of basically being proactive like the project leader or air traffic control and kind of 
yourself. Sometimes all you need to do is liaison with service parts or the mechanic or whatever it is. Sometimes, like you said, with the tonneau cover, you are going to physically do it yourself. But for our listeners, this is really important. You're hearing this from a new sales manager. This is how she got her gig is that she didn't, like there's a Badger commercial. I don't know if you saw those commercials. They're, they're, they're like the stereotypical car people. You know, there's a Badger and he's in the, uh, like in the, the dealership and a customer comes up to him and asks about the service and he turns around and he goes, I'm on my popcorn break. You see the suit? I sell cars. I don't fix them. Grumble, grumble, grumble. I mean, like, you don't want to be one of those old school dinosaur salespeople that don't give a shit about your customer's experience and service and parts because that's technically not your department. It's all your department. Your goal is customer relationship management. Customer relationship management means is that you want the full life cycle. You want their experience to be awesome because if you invest time and energy or McKenna, you said you invested your own money into a customer. Can you imagine if you did all that shit, put your own money into it and some freaking technician or some freaking service writer blew up your experience or pissed off your prospect? That makes no sense whatsoever. You want to make sure that you are always, and I repeat, always controlling the customer's experience. I love it. Okay. Is there any other tips or advice um, you know, wh while you're there in the service department? Is there anything else that you do with them? Um, I would just make sure that they get their appointment set up. So like if a customer will text me and say, oh, hey, I didn't get a call back about this. I'll be like, okay, I'll take control of that. Uh, I think the biggest thing that I see salespeople do is they, they don't invest enough time. They think of it as, oh, this is my only job, but they forget that exactly like you said, they have, it's a whole experience. They don't understand that it's from A to B and you have kind of to take off your hat of, oh, I'm only doing my job and nobody else's. No, if you want to get something done, you have to be willing to do it yourself too and be that liaison for people as well. And service, I mean, a bad service experience can ruin a be back customer. It can ruin a referral customer. It can ruin a complete experience. So you don't want to forget about them when it comes to service. 100% agree. All right, so now, Let's talk about, um, do you work any orphan owners or prior customers? Like, are you only been selling cars for two years, but how, how did you do that? How, like, did you have a process for orphan owners, meaning people that, that bought cars at your dealership, but the salespeople aren't there anymore? Did you have it? Did you work with any of those people? Definitely work with some of those people. And those came from, we have an older gentleman who doesn't necessarily sell as much anymore. He's kind of half retired. I've taken over quite a few of his customers. Um, so talk. So uh, that's another thing. I I keep freaking trying to tell these salespeople that that um, orphan owners are one of the best freaking things ever because the way that the stat goes, the highest closing ratio, the highest grosses in the history of automotive has always been repeat business, repeat business and referrals. But repeat business, prior customers are sixty five to seventy five percent closing ratio. And what people will do is they get like freaking stupid. They're like, well. Uh, the, the orphan owners are just garbage. No, dude, just because they didn't buy a car from you, they bought a car from your dealership. You work at Timber Ford. So if, if somebody purchased a vehicle from your dealership and probably is servicing at your dealership, that is a high target opportunity. So let's say you get some orphan owners. How do you engage them? So let's just say that I am the client of this older salesperson or a salesperson that's no longer there and you are McKenna, the salesperson, and you are going to be you know, I'm going to be your orphan owner. So how do you engage me? What do you say? Oh, I love this. I love like orphan owners and I love be back so, or like repeat customers. So first of all, I'm going to give my tip of advice for you guys out that are listening to find the person, maybe even a salesperson in your store that has retired or that has really good referrals and repeats and they're no longer there. Those customers in particular are going to be super hot because as long as you take care of them the same way as the person that they had relied on before and previous, they're going to trust you and rely on you as well. So I would just call them up. I'd introduce myself and I would just say, hey, Bill, I'll just use Bill as an example. So Bill wanted me to make sure that you're taken care of. He's no longer working here anymore. And I just want to let you know that I'm going to be the point of contact for you. So if you have any questions or about a new vehicle or anybody that's looking for one, or if you can't get a hold of service, that's just always, service is always a, in every dealership. So if you can't get a hold of service, you can't get an appointment or you need help with that. Even if it's a question about a different vehicle at a different dealership that you're looking at buying, I'm happy to help you. And from there, 
they call me. I, I guess I, I'm not sure what else I say, but that kind of is the gist. Okay. And so talk to us, what, like to set proper expectations, like um, let's just say I'm, my name is Sean Bradley. I was with Bill for years. Like, how do they normally respond? Like, or like, because I want to set proper expectations because for whatever crazy reason, salespeople think these are garbage opportunities, but they're really not. From your experience, when you say something like, let's just pretend like I, I, I was the salesperson and you're, you're the, the, the person that their salesperson Bill is no longer there. And I'm like, hey, McKenna, my name is Sean Bradley. Uh, I'm one of the senior sales consultants here at Timber Ford. And, and Bill wanted me to, to reach out to you because he's retiring and he's he's no longer going to be selling cars, but he wanted to make sure that you know that you're taken care of, and if there's anything that you you need in any way, shape, or form, whether it's in sales, service, parts, referrals, financing, I am your liaison with the dealership. Uh, like again, is there anything that I can help you with right now? So when you do something like that, McKenna, like the the sales manager, what is the the feedback from the, from these from these customers? Are they grateful? Are they annoyed? Are they indifferent? What would you say? <laughs> Attention auto dealers, you need an opportunity to do business to do business. AutoWeb is one of the largest suppliers of high quality leads, I mean high quality buyers. At a 10% closing ratio, you will be at less than $190 per car sold. Don't just settle for what you get. AutoWeb can fully customize your results through targeted markets and or zip codes. And as a partner, you will get premium placement within search results. Who better to do that than literally the people that invented automotive internet sales? If you want to sell more cars more often and more profitably, then you need AutoWeb. I'd say majority of them are like usually respond with, oh, I loved so-and-so sales. I love Bill or I'm really excited. Like that makes me happy that somebody's still looking out for me. Uh, you'll have your handful that are just rude and don't want to, you know, don't want to talk to you, but that you kind of just brush off because the other 70% are going to be happy to speak with you or just grateful. They're just, all people want to, what I've found the most is people just want to be acknowledged. They want to be acknowledged. They want to be updated and they just want to know that somebody's thinking about them or somebody cares. About appreciated. Them. People want yes. to be like, I agree. They want to be acknowledged. They want to be relevant. They want to be appreciated. They want to be uh, kept up to date. And, and again, this is the second largest item. The average human being is going to purchase in their lifetime, you know, next to a home. And for some people, this automobile might be the most expensive thing that they ever purchased in their life. Cause they might not even purchase a home throughout their lifetime. So so it is important that we are we're there and let them know, hey, look, this salesperson, whether it's and you you were kind because it sounds like Bill's a good guy, but there's some shitty salespeople that just don't work there anymore that never followed up either. So let's set let's set proper realistic expectations that yeah, when you call an orphan owner, meaning a sales a prospect or a customer that doesn't have a salesperson any longer. It might not be as nice like Bill, who's just retiring or just getting older. It might just be a shitty salesperson that just no longer works there that did no follow up. So you've got to be careful of of who you're calling and 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 all and how you do that. McKenna is just go through in your situation elites. So if you go through the records and there's really no history of consistent communication or consistent follow up, and the salesperson dropped the ball then it's got to be a different strategy. I would say that you need to say something like this. Hey, McKenna, my name is Sean Bradley. I'm one of the senior sales consultants here at Timber Ford. Um, you were working with Carlos, and I'm not even sure if you remember Carlos because I looked in the notes and there wasn't a lot of communication, and I apologize for that. But I want to let you know that I've been in the automotive industry for over 23 years. I love this industry. I love this dealership. And all I want to be able to do is be of service to you. I'm not trying to sell you anything. You already purchased the vehicle from us about a year and a half ago. I'm just here to make sure that your ownership experience is good. So if you got a couple minutes, I just love to see how you're doing in your journey. How's your car doing? I see you, you, you were just into service here, uh, you know, about like uh, two months ago, but that was just a regular service maintenance visit. How is your vehicle doing McKenna? And then they respond with, yeah, it's, that's a great way because I definitely had that too. We've we've been through the salespeople who don't you know commit <laughs> right. or try, and then right. they're gone. They just look for the highest gross, and then they are out the door. Um, and those conversations are never fun. Most of the time, those I feel like those customers just want to vent. They just want to be, and they yeah. they will. They'll tell you, I hated this. They didn't respond to me. They didn't get back to me. Yada yada. And all all I say with that response is, I always say. 
well, I hope that I can, I mean, I plan on taking care of you better than anybody else ever has. And if you have any questions, then definitely let me know because I'm here to help you. Yeah, here's what I would say. And I agree. You, what you want to do, audience listening, is identify if they had a shitty follow-up experience, they had a shitty customer experience, a shitty CRM experience. What you got to be careful is don't apologize for your dealership, but you could say things like this, McKenna, it sounds like you didn't have the best experience. It sounds like, you know, Carlos might have not followed up with you the right way. And for that I apologize. However, I'm not Carlos. All I could tell you is here's what I'm willing to do for you. Boom, boom, boom. And then depending my personality, I'm a professional. I've been doing this for 23 years. I might even use something personal. I'm like, McKenna, listen to me. If I may, I'm married. I've been with my wife for 15 years, but she's my second wife. I was married for two years before. My current wife, when I first got together with her, she said, listen, I don't want to hear shit about your ex-wife because I'm not her. And I laughed and, and, and it's true. So it's not that I don't care. I just want you not to judge me for any experience you've had with somebody else, whether it's at this dealership or somewhere else, because I'm not that person. I just want, and here's, a, here's an old school word track. I just want you to give me 1% of trust and I'm going to earn the other 99%. You could use that. Okay. And so uh, again, your goal is to make them feel comfortable. I mean, for the love of God, these people have already purchased a vehicle from your dealership. They might even be servicing their car from your dealership. What we've got to do is just plug into them, connect with them, get them to like us, trust us, and believe us. And then, you know, game's on. Here's what I'm going to say also. This is a pro tip. McKenna, I don't even know if you know this, but this is for you and for your, your new team that you're managing and for everybody else listening. I strongly implore you. Google it. Implore is a great word. Here's another one. Beseech. I beseech you. All right. I want you, once you engage an orphan owner, is to do a reverse lookup on social media. Find these people on Facebook, on Instagram, on WhatsApp, okay, WhatsApp is one of the greatest ones for minorities in social media. It's amazing because they give free long distance calling. So boom, boom. okay, and uh, LinkedIn. So I said Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, and LinkedIn. Those are the four social platforms. So let's say McKenna is an orphan owner. Okay, let's say she worked, uh, she bought a car from this guy, Bill. Bill's no longer there. He went on to enjoy the rest of his, his golden years, right? So I reach out to McKenna, whether I, I connect with her or not, immediately, if I'm trying to connect with her, I'm going to find McKenna on social media. I'm gonna follow her, I'm gonna friend request her for multiple reasons. Reason number one is I wanna gather as much field intelligence about her as possible. Birthdays, anniversaries, spouses, siblings, hobbies, interests, any shit about automobiles on her, her pages. I wanna gather that information and then I want to update my CRM. Assume that the other salesperson is never as good as you and will not be as good as you. So what you wanna be able to do is engage the orphan owner opportunity. Then you wanna friend request them, why? Because once you friend request them, here's what happens. You will have, sometimes people have privacy settings on their social media. And if you're not connected with them officially, you might not be able to see all of their posts and all their information and all their stuff. So think about it. If I'm trying to, you know, uh, have McKenna as my, as my customer and, and in an orphan owner situation, her salesperson is not there. Yes, I want to connect with her, but I also want to learn about her. You know, seek first to understand. I want to qualify, identify wants, wishes, expectations, habits, family, things are important. Why? Because all this shit is important. Then I want to customize this in my CRM. Now, here's another thing. If I'm connected with this orphan owner on social media, I now have another layer of access because everybody phone calls, emails, text messages. Maybe some people might do video email, video text message, but most people are not using social media DMs. So if I'm connected on social media, I could DM direct message. I could go in our DMs in Instagram, WhatsApp, LinkedIn, or Facebook. So this gives me a whole new plethora of opportunities to engage the prospect. And here's another one. 
sometimes when you call, email, or text somebody, they just ignore you. Actually, most of the times people ignore you. But if I'm connected with McKenna on social media, and as long as I'm posting awesome stuff on my social media, it's almost like positive propaganda, positive propaganda. So McKenna's seen all these amazing posts now of me at Timber Ford, Timber Ford, Timber Ford, you know, key toss, key toss, key toss, key toss, you know, uh, you know, happy customers, happy customers, happy customers, you know, awesome posts, awesome posts, often posts. So this might help her get to know me before she even talks to me. This might influence her. This is a good word. This might influence her to taking my phone call, to calling me back, to returning my text message, to returning my email because she's caught into my social media propaganda. McKenna, what do you think about that? I love that. I think that's great. Yeah. All right, mm -hmm. good. So now let's get into what you were really good at. How were you marketing on social media and branding yourself to generate prospects yourself? Um, I mean, if you look up on my, my Instagram is primarily where I'm focusing on right now. Um, Facebook will be a little bit more. I'm not as on there as much, but people just like seeing the key tosses. I mean, you could go into town and people just think they're so fun to watch. That would be probably my primary. And I can't take credit for that fully. It's I, there's a girl who actually posted it in the millionaire car salesman group as an idea. And I took it and kind of customized it and made it my own. <laughs> so I can't remember her name, but shout out to her for, cause she does that as well. It's a little Wait bit a minute. Different. So that's really exciting. So you were, you were a member in our millionaire car salesman group and you saw another female salesperson, you know, create this key toss idea. You took it cause you liked it. And that's what you're supposed to do in our group. And you, you modified it and made it, you know, like your, your style. And then it blew up. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, in our in our area, yeah, for sure. That's, that's so freaking people awesome. People know me because of that, and they know our store because of that, and like it's just, it's people come into here. I swear, when the, our energy's up, like that is huge. Like people don't realize that how much your energy impacts everybody else. And we are busier on days that it's fun here. <laughs> I guess it's a good way to put it. Let's talk about that. How much has the Millionaire Car Salesman Group helped you? Like, how much have you learned? you know, from the group and from our other members and, and how do you use the group and how do you learn and how do you find ideas? Oh gosh. Yeah. I make every single salesperson, even when I wasn't in the manager role, jump into that as soon as they start, because it's just surrounding yourself with people that are in the same boat as you, that it are going to push you better is the best thing to do. Um, and there's just so many good tips and tricks and everybody's from different areas of the States too. And so getting those ideas from them. And I, it's helped me a lot. I, I don't think I'd be here, honestly, without it. <laughs> wow. So for our, our podcast listeners, what you might not understand, because we have a huge, there's over half a million downloads on the Millionaire Carson podcast, which is just amazing to me. But sometimes our podcast listeners don't know that we actually have a massive Facebook group. We have officially the number one Facebook group for the entire automotive industry. And we're sitting on, you know, approximately 24,000 members, which 98.5% of them are frontline salespeople, managers, GSMs, internet directors, BD directors, CRM managers, digital marketing managers, general managers, dealer principals, owners, corporate executives. So we have this massive Facebook group with 24,000 automotive professionals, managers, and owners. And in there, on a daily basis, they're posting questions, they're posting success tips, they're doing this, that, and everything. And what you're telling me is that you've been fluent in this group, and one of the ideas you got was the key toss thing, which blew up in your town. That's, that's freaking amazing, McKenna. I'm really excited for you. All right, so let's get into for the rest of this interview. Holy crap, congratulations. You're a new sales manager at 25 years old. Like, how does that feel? It kind of feels surreal, honestly. <laughs> I don't think I expected, I mean, I knew I'd be here because it's what I wanted and that's my goal. But I mean, my goal is to, you know, obviously own something at some point, but manager was the next step and it just happened pretty quickly. But I put my time in on one of my actually our finance manager called me psychotically motivated the, the other day. So I thought that was very fitting. Um, I knew what I wanted and I went for it, I guess is a good way to put it too. So you want to be the best sales manager possible. And we had this conversation because you're one of our clients as well. And, you know, um, I, I feel that sales managers in general 
are for whatever reason they stop learning they stop training like they don't take the oem certification very seriously a lot of them they don't take regular training and they, they here's the excuses i get uh i'm already a manager I'm, i i should you know i know all this already okay so they think they know it all already or they had the experience that's why they're a manager or they're so busy they don't have time to sharpen the saw to to train and to learn how do you feel about that like do you think that it's okay for sales managers to stop training and stop learning and stop evolving no i i i think that that's what maybe would like prevent your team from moving forward i guess or getting better because when you stop as a manager you stop so is your sales staff so you're not doing it why would anybody else i in particular had a very good sales manager um he's Going to be helping me with this whole transition in general he pushes me motivates me you don't always find that so i was very lucky in that aspect but you know that's somebody who hasn't stopped learning whereas his thing is more he is having trouble with being busy a lot you know but you as a salesperson can always relieve that a little too so just keep that in mind guys <laughs> you can always be doing a little bit more um but i think as a sales manager you need to be motivated and excited and if you're learning your team's going to be learning if you're not learning why would i want to put time as a sales staff if you're not yeah i, I here's what i think i think it's amazing you know because one of the biggest things uh, is is respect because I'm sorry, but if you're a sales manager and you've never taken it up before and you never sold a car before, I, I can't really take you seriously. Like, obviously, like, I'm not a douchebag. Like, I'll listen to you because you're my boss, but I'm not going to really respect you. You know what I mean? Like, and I, I'm not saying in a disrespectful way, but I'm just saying, like, how are you going to tell me to do something that you're not qualified to do? That you've never done it or you sucked at it. You know what I mean? You, on the other hand, girl, are amazing because you have an amazing foundation that you could build on. You are a 30 car woman. I mean, like I, I averaged 33 cars. So I was only a couple more, more than you. And I turned out pretty good, right? You know what I'm saying? So yeah. the fact that you have that credentials, that credibility that you are on the floor, not only that you sold 30 cars, but you also built your own brand. You diversified, you worked the service department, you worked orphan owners, you generated referrals. I mean, like this builds the credibility. And now as you, you know, as my client, I'm coaching you as a sales manager that what I want you to do is I want you to go hard at this Ford certification. I want you to get not only Ford um, OEM sales management certified, but there's different levels. I want to get you to the top tier level for Ford certification because then your, your, your employees and your salespeople can't bullshit because if you're their sales manager and you're putting all this time, not just to guess the answers in the OEM certification, but you're actually doing it, then they have zero excuses. They can't mess around. They've got to do it themselves. Would you agree? I agree, 100%. Same thing. You guys are on Brad and Demand Train, you know, like our complete video on a train. Like if you as a sales manager put in hours doing this training, then your salespeople can't bullshit or mess up because, man, I mean, like, man, I can't joke around. My sales manager is doing all this stuff. So, again, I think that one of the best aspects of being a good sales manager is is living the life you know, like, like, like not just being about it, not just talking about it, but being about it. I mean, like if you are telling me, do this, do this, do this, and you not only have done it, but you continue to do it. I got to respect that. And I got to fall into line. Do you agree with me? Is this what your part of your plan is? Yep. That's my plan. hundred percent. Yep. I want my sales staff to also feel comfortable coming to me with questions. And then I also want them to, here's another thing that I think helped me a lot was my sales manager would constantly tell me, go figure it out, go figure it out. As far as like, don't come to me, come to me only when you actually need to. Whereas a lot of times I was relying on his knowledge, but then he forced me to figure out how to find those answers myself too, which you have to be then as a sales staff too. You have to want to learn. You can't just expect the sales manager to give you every answer under the sun and then you just rely on them. So I wanted to throw that in there too. Well, you know that that's a very, very, very strategic strategy for sales management. It's called FITFO, right? Figure the fudge out. There you go. <laughs> that's the Christian version. You could use the other version too, if you want, if you're a little <laughs> animated, figure it the, you know, fudge out. So no, I like that. So part of your style is going to be, is that you want to motivate and you want to lead, but you want to have your team try to figure things out, learn, evolve, use their 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 creativity, correct? 
Correct. I want them to want to be the best of the best too. And I'm going to inspire them by doing that, <laughs> being okay. that too. All right. So tell me in your opinion, this is a great question then. What does it mean to you as a sales manager? What should the job description and the job justification be of a sales manager? McKenna, as a new, newly appointed sales manager at a Ford dealership, what is a sales manager and what is a sales manager supposed to be? And tell me, what are you going to do as a sales manager for your team? I think a sales manager needs to be somebody who's going to instill confidence and motivate their sales team to sell. I mean, your job essentially is to sell cars, right? You're, you're getting your sales staff to sell cars, whether that's training them on a personal development aspect or the car sales techniques or selling ways of selling things like that i want to also be encompassing their the personal development side of it too because i think that is how i've gotten to this point i mean because there's been a lot of tough things you have to learn when you're i mean even just getting into sales in general you have to be very open with yourself very aware of what you're i mean you have to change you have to be better you have to get better you have to constantly be growing and I mean, that's what I want to be as a manager and instill my sales staff. And I'm going to do that by being excited, bringing the energy every day, by training them with different, whether that's like one-on-one -on -one trainings or role-playing, things like that. Um, oh, I hope that answers the question. I don't know. That's pretty good. Let me help you a little bit. <clears throat> I agree with what you said, but let me, let, me, let me just sit like this. I believe that what a real sales manager's job is, is to develop an award-winning championship team. You know what I'm saying? So again, to me, a real manager, because there's like, I'm the type of person, I think you're, if you're a 30 car girl, you just want to do shit yourself because that's, you were built like that. You know what I'm saying? Like you're built to, to just like, let's just go hard to the bottom. Let's get shit done. Let's be successful. That's not going to help in a sales management environment. You like, even if you're the superstar, it's, you're going to be overworking yourself if you're doing every employee's job for them. So if you think about it, it's almost like Avengers, Avengers assemble. You need to develop the most incredible team. You're at a small dealership. So if you only have four salespeople or five salespeople, if you think about this, Holy crap. If you have five salespeople, right? If one of them sucks, 20% of your department sucks. If you've got two people that are not doing good, oh my God, that's 40% of your department. So having the right people on your team, that's, that's a big part of this is picking your team. And once you have the team, I've said this before, and I still is from one of my competitors. Did you hire them dead or kill them after you got them? Meaning, do you have the wrong person there? Or by God willing, you hired an amazing person, or if you got a great person on the team, did you develop them the right way? And what happens is this, there's different types of developing. So take some notes, listeners and McKenna, you've got training, right? Training them is the technical stuff, like the road to the sale, objections, rebuttals, qualification, how to fill out a credit application, the paperwork, the steps, all that stuff. Training is one thing, but then helping them with personal development. What is personal development? Personal development, McKenna, is going to be things like how to problem solve, how to deal with difficult people, how to have more patience. You see what I'm saying? This is, these are attributes and things that, that certain human beings need to work on. Dr. Covey says from the seven habits of highly effective people, there's different maturity continuums from codependent, independent to interdependence. To me, this is all personal development, right? Mm -hmm. So as a sales manager, one, one, one box is training, 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 training. That's your responsibility. But another box is going to be personal development, personal development to make people better human beings that are going to help them perform better in all aspects, including business and in their career. Now, professional development is different than personal development. Professional development might be something that's not just skills like objections and rebuttals and, and word tracks, but it might be, you know, having them go to Toastmasters. Toastmasters is like a gym for public speakers. So if you think about this, McKenna, this is deep. If you were a, if you were a singer, right, and you were going to sing at a concert, 
you have to work on your vocal cords, right? You have, you have a vocal coach for range, pitch, things like that. If you play guitar, I'm just my strum, right? You got to practice your guitar. If you're, uh, you know, play a flute, you got to practice your flute, right? What is the instrument of a sales professional? Speech, auditory. That's what we do. We speak. So how do you get better salespeople? Vocabulary, ad-libbing, speech, articulation, stagecraft, right? Like there's so many different levels to this psychology, strategy, personalities. This is what's called professional development. There's neuro linguistics. You feel me? There's so many different things that you can do on a professional development level. Here's one other box. So we've got training, we've got personal development, we got professional development, and then we got team building. See, a lot of times McKenna managers screw up because they pit people against each other. And it is a competition. I get the board, but interdependence and synergy are the most powerful combinations for any type of business or human beings. We are better together than apart. Synergy is defined as two or more agents are greater than their individual effect peanut butter, good, jelly, good, but you put a peanut butter and jelly sandwich with some milk together, damn it, you got a banging ass lunch. So my point being is that what we want to be able to do is do team building. I'm, I'm not even kidding. You got a small enough company. You know, what's a great team building escape the room. Like one of those escape the room type things. And because and, what you don't want to do is this, you don't want to confuse team building with an award or a bonus. Cause I have managers that, that do a steak dinner. Well, look, I'm going to give you, this is a true story. It happened a couple of years ago. My wife and I are diehard Eagles fans. We are friends with a, a Hall of Fame Eagle named Trey Thomas. So when my wife was in the music industry and she was doing Karina Bradley, Trey Thomas's niece um, was one of my wife's backup dancers. And so we, we have a really good relationship. So Trey Thomas, number 72, 72, is obviously retired from the Eagles. He's a sportscaster now and he's in the hall, he's a Hall of Famer, but he owns a paint and sip. You ever see those businesses where you have the alcohol, the wine, and you could go paint? They do that in Wisconsin? Um, yes, I've heard yeah. of it. So yeah. he owns, this is a true story. He owns a place called uh, Pino's Palette in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. So what I did is I wanted to do a big team building exercise. So I booked out the whole thing. So I had 20 plus of my employees go there and I was going to, I had Trey, this, it's all videotaped and this really happened. I had Trey Thomas from the Eagles there signing helmets and autographs and stuff like that. And then I had my whole team there. We had a couple bottles of like wine and stuff like that. And then we had canvases and we had an art instructor and it was just a team building exercise that we had to listen to directions from the lead painter, but it was fun and it was outside the dealership. Whether it's it's a it's a painting thing or it's like high elements, high elements are like when you get the Swiss seat on and you have like the repelling. I mean, there's leadership things that you could do, but when you do exercises that are engineered to get people to work together, to solve problems, to, um, to communicate, to articulate, to win together, it strengthens the team. You know what I mean? And so again, as a sales manager, I really believe that it's more than just training. There's training, there's skill training, but there's personal development, there's professional development, and there's team building. McKenna, the way that I break it down, how did, how did you receive that information? Do you agree with me? Do you like where I'm going with this? Yeah, I plan on doing all of those things. Yeah, I just, that's a way better breakdown than what I could have given you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let me just build into it because this is obviously for you too, not just for our tens of thousands of listeners and stuff like that, is that I also believe a sales manager's job is to identify any problems, any obstacles, any obstructions from each and every of their team and remove them. That's what your job is. You know, your job is to, is to constantly be circling through. And I believe a dealership, this is deep. I believe a dealership is made or broken maximized or underutilized in four key quadrants, your products, your people, your process, your promotions. Let me explain. When I say products, I don't just mean inventory, but inventory is part of it. If you don't have inventory, then as a sales manager, it's your job to either, you know, figure out acquisition, 
where you could buy, you know, vehicles from the public or from the auction or from social media or from whatever. But products is one thing. But then you have tools, you have e-leads, you have a website. You need to make sure that your team has every product or resource that they need to be successful. But having a CRM doesn't mean shit if it's not set up the right way, if they're not trained on it, if you haven't verified that they actually learned something on it and they're actually using it. So when I say that the dealership has made or broken, maximized or underutilized in four key you know, uh, quadrants, products, people, process, promotion for the products, your team needs to have the right tools and right resources. They need to be set up the right way. Your people need to be trained the right way. And there needs to be a testing or accountability to verify that they have. Because just because they were lectured doesn't mean they're learning and comprehending. See, information without application is just information, but information with application equals transformation, right? People, you need to have the right people, the right amount of people. They need to be trained, onboarded the right way. They need to have the training, the personal development, professional development, team building. They have to have the right pay plan. They have the right, right schedule. They have to have the right communications. Process, the next P. They need to know what to do, when to do it, how to do it, and why to do it. Again, they need to know what to do, when to do it, how to do it, and why to do it. You need to have SOPs, standard operating procedures, outbound phone call process, inbound phone call process, qualifications, objections, rebuttals. What happens if this happens? What is my dead deal process? What is my TO process? What is my, my key machine process? Girl, there's a lot of shit you got to do, but you need to make sure that these standard operating procedures are articulated and then P for promotions. You need opportunities to do business to do business. You need to know as a sales manager that each of your people under your command have eight ways they could sell a car. The reason NADA says that the average salesperson sells 10 cars or less is because they're only triggering on two to three ways. That means the average salesperson is not using all eight ways. They might be taking phone ups, internet ups, and, and maybe some you know uh, walk-ins, or they might do walk-ins and be-backs and internet, but not phone. So as a sales manager, you need to really focus on all eight ways. Teach them how to properly do the road to sale so they could crush walk-in spots, but teach them the importance and the strategy on how to maximize all be-backs. Teach them how to you know, generate opportunities from their prior customers or orphan owners. Teach them that the service department is one of the most incredible aspects and in how to work the service drive. Okay, how to do data mining, equity mining, how to maximize internet sales, phone sales, how to generate referrals, and how to do what you did, build their brand within Timber Ford and generate prospects. So all of this to me is a sales manager, but then there's more. Sometimes you've got to be their friend. Sometimes you've got to be their therapist. Sometimes you've got to be their marriage counselor. You have to create a SWOT assessment for each one of your employees. Just like I, I as the trainer, have told you that I need a SWOT assessment for you, meaning I want you to identify your strengths your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats, threats meaning challenges. Well, the same thing that I'm doing for you as my client, I want you to do for each one of your people under your command is get them to create a SWOT assessment because part of what you've got to do is macro micro. Macro means you got to manage them on a macro level, on a team level, on a department level, but on a micro level, because everybody's different, people have different ways that you think. There's kinesthetic thinkers, there's visual thinkers, there's auditory thinkers, there's hybrid thinkers, there's different personality types, blah, 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 blah. Not everyone under your command is going to learn and absorb at the same rate, the same level, and have the same situation. That's why one-on-ones are very, very important. So yes, you're going to have management meetings and management activities, but part of what you've got to do is time maximize yourself to be able to have individual time for one-on-ones. And so you do that by leveraging the SWOT assessments. McKenna, what do you think about my definition about a sales manager? Dang, <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> All right, girl. Uh, you have any last questions for me? I don't think so, no. Thank All you right, so much. I want to just acknowledge one thing because my wife is the CEO of Dealer Synergy. She's amazing. She's the better executive than I am. My two daughters are crushing it. Tiana's nationally you know, recognized superstar in our industry, digital dealer, NADA, Ally, you know, and, you know, Ally Bank, um, NAMAD, it's just amazing. And then my other daughter, you know, is working at RK Kia Subaru. So I've got on the retail side and I got on the national trainer side. And I'm saying this because there's not enough females 
in automotive and there's damn sure not enough females in management. Girl, I don't know if you realize this, but what, what you just accomplished is very, very rare. You know that, right? So you are a young 25-year-old female sales manager at a freaking Ford dealership. Ford is the number one brand on the planet. There are more Ford f 150 sold in the world than there are full-blown VWs. Every VW lineup doesn't add up to as many F-150 sales. And the F-150 has been the number one selling vehicle for 45, 46 years, whatever the hell it's been. And you are a sales manager at a Ford dealership at 25 years old. How do you feel about that? Are you proud as a female in automotive? Talk to me about that. Extremely proud. Yes. Yes. I'm, I don't even really have that much to say about it. I'm just, yeah, you put in the work and you, I just know that if you do that, you can literally do anything. So that's a kind of a message to anybody out there. You put your work in, your time in, and you are confident in yourself. You can do it too. And what I want you to do is this. I want you to recruit and hire more amazing females too. Our industry needs more people like you, McKenna. You should be very proud of yourself because I'm very proud of you for what you accomplished. And I'm really glad to be, you know, uh, your training company, be able to help you uh, do more, be more and achieve more. And most importantly, sharing your success because I know you're going to crush it. You're a rising star. Oh, thank you so much. So there you have it. The Millionaire Car Salesman Podcast. This podcast comes to you every week from the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. If you have a question about the show or would like the chance to become a guest, feel free to contact us directly at 856-546-2440 or email us at millionairecarsalesman at gmail.com. This program is a presentation of Synergy Records. Produced by Tiana Mick and L.A. Williams. Production and engineering by L.A. Williams. The Millionaire Car Salesman podcast is hosted every week by L.A. Williams and the millionaire car salesman himself, Sean V. Bradley. The Millionaire Car Salesman podcast can be found everywhere, so please don't forget to review, subscribe to, and share the show. Thanks for listening to the Millionaire Car Salesman podcast, and remember, where I'm from, money provides options. The Millionaire Car Salesman podcast is sponsored in part by AutoWeb. If you enjoyed this podcast, then make sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and leave us a review. You know, let some other folks know about it. Oh, and don't forget to join the Millionaire Car Salesman group on Facebook. We'll see you there.